My name is Mark. I'm uh, the studio owner and founder of Studio Renderburn. Thanks for Max on having me here at FMX again. My last FMX is five years ago, but it's nice to be again here. And thanks for Intel sponsoring that talk today about realism in visual effects. And some words on my studio. Um, I found Renderburn back in 2001. Me, I'm a studied communication designer. Uh, sort of, and um, I'm a Maxon certified lead instructor. That means I write training stuff for Maxon, focused on shading, lighting, and rendering. And recently, my studio also became Maxon authorized training center, sounding big, and uh, maybe it is big. You can learn shading, lighting, and rendering stuff there. Okay, let's have a look at the most recent and hopefully the best work so far with the 2018 2019 showreel. So, uh, that was the most recent show, and as you can see, my focus is on visualization and visual effects. And today's talk is about a new work I created for Intel. Uh, it is called Apollinaris Straße, Apollinaris Street, a street in my hometown, and the inspiration comes from an apartment from a friend of, friend of mine. And I did a workload for Intel for benchmarking a brand new processor, I will tell you more about in just a second. And today's talk is about shading, lighting, rendering for VFX, or to say it in a more beautiful words, the ingredients to realism. So um, before we do that, let's dive into a brief introduction on the term realism. So what is realism? Realism in fine arts, in media, in modern media, in painting, in CGI is highly subjective because it is highly depending on the era you're living in and your habits of perception, of course. So, let's have an example, paintings. So, who knows that? Caravaggio, Chiascuro, 
painting technique, meaning the contrast between bright areas, dark areas, the directing with light. A very uh, influential artist, very progressive artist, playing with a high level of realism at that time, 1600, 1599, imagine that. And still influential on today's work of directors and directors of photography and lighting artists. 60 years later, we have Johannes Vermeer painting The Milkmaid. And what's fascinating to me about this painting is he's introducing an everyday scene, not saints, not a calling by Jesus, no gods, no royals, a maid pouring milk. And that's a fascinating moment because that increases realism. As you introduce everyday scenes, you're increasing realism automatically, almost. And what is fascinating to me about this picture is you can almost smell the breadcrumb. You can see uh, the subsurface scattering of the bread. You can almost hear the milk being poured in. And the, you can see the texture of the maid. And it's almost photoreal to me. While we're talking about photorealism, let's take a huge leap into the 1960s and 70s where hyperrealism established. And this is a work of David T. Kessler, found on Wikipedia. And I had to look twice, because this is not a photo, this is a painting, acrylic on canvas. And when you look at these uh, floral elements here, you might get the idea, okay, that must have been painted, or those spots here might be airbrushed, maybe. But this is a totally everyday scene, it's almost boring topic, guys standing around during a vacation. But as the title of that series of works suggests, it's end of role. So Kessler is introducing artifacts, analog artifacts from the end of the film slide, overexposures or something like that. And that makes it different, difficult to distinguish from a real photo because why would you do that, destroy your image? Because you enhance realism. And that's one of my favorite contemporary painters. It's Johannes Vesmark from Sweden. You can follow him on Facebook or at Johannes Vesmark SE. And this is also acrylic on canvas. It's admirable. It's, the level of realism is just mind blowing. It's a guy with his paintbrush and he's doing photos. It's, wow. So let's have another example in more. Our focus, it's about the visual effects for film. Remember Walking with Dinosaurs by Framestore and BBC? Increasing the realism of prehistoric creatures over the Jurassic Park level from 1993. That was 1999, and still, 20 years later, we would not consider that anymore as perfect photorealism. So, as times are changing, habits of perception are cha changing. And remember Star Wars Episode One. At that time, it was mind-blowing. Today, you wouldn't say that this guy is photorealistic. So, realism is highly subjective and depending on era and habits of perception. And it's also depending on cultural background. Let's have a simple example. My grandma and my early work. My grandma, living in the deepest south Austria as a farmer, when I showed her my early work from 2001, this one, she asked me, hmm, where did you film that? So, Grandma, that's not film, that's computer. Oh, oh, come on, okay. So, to her, it was perfectly credible. And um, 17 years later, I did that landscape animation, and that was my recent level of realism. So, as times are changing, um, the consideration of realism changes heavily. Okay, and as we're talking about my late grandma in her mid 70s, late 70s, um, Realism is also subjective depending on age because it does make a difference if you grew up with the visual effects of Gladiator from 2000 or you were blown away by the level of detail in um, Independence Day Resurgence from 2016. So there's also a difference. That brings us to a conclusion. Realism is highly subjective and leads us to a question. What are the ingredients to realism and is there more to realism, maybe, than just the render engine? Two interesting questions we will have, hopefully we'll have answers in that talk today. Um, let's have a look at the work. The 
Nix. Licht. So, that's it. It's, it's basically, it's a study about light in an apartment. And at the end, for those non-German speakers, um, uh, at the end there was uh, some lines of text. She was asking what are filming, and he was answering nothing. Light, ooh, philosophy. Um, so uh, a little, um, as we call it, meta even. Okay, back to presentation. And uh, yeah, this workload was developed um, with something in mind, of course. Um, what I wanted to do is an animated still life, basically, in, in, a, in a found footage style, and with a handheld camera and real life character. And um, the reason I did this workload was to benchmark a new, brand new CPU from Intel. It's the brand new Intel Xeon W3175X CPU with 28 cores and 56 threads at 3.1 gigahertz. So there were some scene requirements, of course. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, everything that's fun to render or that's pain to render uh, depends on the point of view. And so that means subsurface scattering, caustics, rough reflections, and so on and so on. And something about the scene size, not larger than 400 gigabytes, 35 gigs, uh, uh, megabytes, 35 gigs RAM, a render time between 30 and 50 minutes per full HD frame. And all of this is done with our beloved and maybe aging, but still cool physical render of Cinema 4D, which is using Antel Embry technology, by the way. Okay, something on the hardware specs. I talked about the CPU, that were the hardware specs, and this is the machine while it is being, it has been assembled. So it's a pretty heavy, heavy monster, and as well, uh, the um, Cinebench results are also pretty impressive. 13,035 Cinebench points in Cinebench release 20. That means that baby is and eating render buckets for breakfast. So it's fast. Okay, back to the ingredients to realism. We have certain areas we can apply that term. It's modeling, shading, lighting, composition, rendering, and compositing. So all those steps you're um, going through while developing a project from the beginning to the end. And let's begin with modeling. Uh, one of the, let's say, maybe rules or good ideas behind realism in terms of modeling is apply a high level of detail, but don't overdo it. That means concentrate details in certain areas and don't be afraid to leave other areas perhaps maybe blank. Why not? Concentrate details here. You have here a lot of hair going on on the branches of the tomato. You have texture details going on. You have a lot of procedural texturing going on here with the fruits and other areas are not so detailed. Why? Because you're focusing the spectator's eye. You're guiding the eye. That's your, your job as a director. Basically, you are a director when doing 3D animation. If you, here are the branches with all those hair and spots and drops going on. Okay. If you don't do that, if you're not concentrating details to certain areas while leaving other areas less detailed, you have a horror vacui. That's a Latin term from the era of Baroque, where artists were afraid to leave areas blank. And everything, every single inch, got filled up with ornaments and details, and it looked like this. Okay, you're blown away, but what for? You're confused. So don't do that. This area is over. Okay, a lot of detail, but don't overdo it. Let's have a live demo uh, about the hairs of a tomato. And basically, it's not hair. It's a brand new feature from release 20 of Cinema 4D. Here we have our tomatoes. And the tomatoes have branches. These branches were modeled with a brand new technique from the release 20 called volumes. Basically, these bodies here are just stacked NURBs or generator objects, not NURBs, generator objects, sweep, sweep objects. And they're stacked into each other and then meshed with a volume measure. I don't want to go too much into detail here, but on this mesh, changed to a polygonal object, I applied a MoGraph cloner. So I scattered basically instances, multi-instances, also introduced with Cinema 4D Release 20, all over these branches. 
And what, what I scattered was this. Sweet nerves turned to polygonal objects, little hairs, and then scattered across the branches of the tomato. Let's render that. Yeah, there are some results. So there is tiny, tiny um, detail going on there, a tiny scale of detail, and 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 you don't see a single hair in the final rendering. You see some just just some fluffy coating of the branch, and that's making up realism. Uh, so that's a perfect example for concentrating detail, maybe overdo it in a certain part of the scene and leave others less detailed, as you can see here with the surface of the tomato itself. Even the leaves have small hairs, curly hairs. Okay, back to topic, ingredients to realism in terms of shading. Um, when we have a look at the total scene at the beginning, at the establishing shot, we see there's a lot of different materials going on here. And we have metal surfaces with fingerprints and smear artifacts on it. We have plastic that wants to look like metal. We all know that we're going into the electronic metal market, uh, buy a nice item for our household, touch it, it looks like silver or metal, and it says, oh, I'm, I'm silver, I'm only touch it, it's warm, it's plastic. So that's one of them here, that blender here, a uh, mixer. Blender or mixer? Okay. We have glass here, we have fruits and vegetables, metals, glass, liquids, and so on. So different characteristics of materials require different so-called BSDFs. Is anyone not familiar with the term BSDF? One. Okay, I will, I will explain to you. BSDF is nothing but a very complex, uh, a short for a very complex term. It's called bidirectional scattering distribution function. That's nothing else than a mathematical function that describes how light behaves, how light evolves from the brightest point to the border between day and night, called the terminator. So what's the behavior, what's the characteristics of light spreading across the object? And in Cinema 4D we have two um, uh, BSDFs available in the color channel of our material system. I will say something on that topic a little later. We have Lambert, which is perfectly for perfectly smooth um, uh, surfaces, and we have Orinaya, which is more satinated, more rough, more um, where there are more micro facets. And uh, we have something else on board in Cinema 4D. While we're talking about fruits and oranges or vegetables like tomatoes, we're dealing with, of course, SSS, subsurface scattering, of course. Light penetrating the object and scattered inside the volume. And for this, we're using subsurface scattering. And this is based on an even more complex term, bidirectional scattering surface reflectance distribution function. Okay, that's too much. But as you can see here, this BSSRDF contains also the letters BSDF. And if you have a look at it, it also contains, wow, diffuse reflection. But it's just, this preview here is just the luminance channel with subsurface scattering on. But obviously there's some reflective component to it. So we keep that in mind for fruits or Objects highly depending on subsurface scattering, we can only shade them with subsurface scattering because there's also a diffuse component to it. Better than words is live demo. Have a look at our orange here. The modeling of the orange is just a sphere in hexahedron mode and a displaced deformer. That displaced deformer is taking all the information that's coming from the displacement channel with a checkbox emulation. See that? Emulation, so it emulates all the information from the displacement channel. And uh, when I turn off my color channel, there's still ooh, diffuse reflection going on here because we're doing some subsurface scattering stuff in the luminance channel. And inside the luminance channel, there is some procedural stuff going on. We have a layer shader here inside that is perfect as a container for stacking shaders. And we have some noise shaders going on. If you want to have a good introduction to noise shaders, check out my last year's SIGGRAPH talk from Vancouver 2018. You can find it on my website, randaburin.de.
faith healing here. And uh, in, the, in the section, publications. Okay, so um, we're doing some procedural stuff here in the luminance channel, and this is feeding in the subsurface scattering shader. Okay, so that's the interesting point. We have a reflective component to uh, subsurface scattering as well. But I wanted to punch out a bit more the um, diffuse reflection, so I introduced 50% of real diffuse reflection. When I render that, hopefully it works, just a laptop, okay, you see that there on the, let's say, terminator, the border between day and night, there's some scattering beneath the surface going on, and still there's a good uh, punchy diffuse reflection on, reflect on, sorry, reflection on the light side going on. Um, this is looking a bit too uh, low poly because I didn't turn on sub-polygon displacement for performance reasons. Bring procedural shading to perfection. Um, I already showed you s some things in terms of procedural shading when it comes to uh, the orange. Let's have a look at an apple, how an apple is uh, shaded procedurally with all of its details and uh, head over to Cinema 4D and have a look how an apple can be shaded. It might sound um, too easy, maybe, but believe me, an apple can contain a lot of detail that's ending up very complex. Okay. <laughs> it's looking complex and it is even a bit complex. I just turn off all those layers for the moment and come on. And as a base ingredients, we have just a color here. About that, there's a folder with some noises going on. The most important from them is um, a pearly noise with a high contrast. And in combination with some other noises going on, it's masking a color. And when I render that, it's get, I get this structure here. A huge pearly noise being maybe masked or distracted by other noises. And when I specify this principle even more, meaning masking colors with noises, I get even more details to my apple. And when it comes to all those tiny streaks and dots, it's always masking something, masking colors with noises, basically. Noises being maybe unproportionately stretched for streaks, And even those stripes here are just a noise masked by a color gradient to the top of my apple. And when I complete this setup with almost the same ingredients as we get this perfectly um, naturally looking uh, diffuse reflection. But still, this is something made out of plastic, so we need of course, some bump information. The bump channel also carries some noise shaders. And this is even looking more natural now, especially when in combination with some reflectance going on. But still, this is stoneware or stone or plastic, so we need luminance channel turned on with subsurface scattering. And while this is rendering, I'm talking about the fact why I didn't use node-based materials in this case. Because um, Cinema 3D released 20, got a new kill feature, it's the node-based material system, but there's one little downside to that. Currently, it doesn't support subsurface scattering. So that's the reason why I stick to the classic material system in that case and do all my shading stuff with the classical material system. So as rendering is finished, now we have a quite good apple here. It's a Brie Burn, and it's, it should taste quite good, hopefully. You might get the idea that a realistic uh, lighting is the main ingredient to realism, and you're right, it is, beside, of, co of course, shading and modeling and all the other stuff, but lighting is very important because you, you're not only doing, um, let's say, uh, purely technical stuff, 
you're also doing direct, directing stuff. So you're a director with light. So you guide the eye. You can totally uh, dump your scene with light, or you can, you can um, make it even better with the, with the right lighting. So let's have a look at the lighting here. You see there's a daylight. The sun is obviously coming from a lower angle. Maybe it's morning. And there's a lot of indirect light going on. And um, yeah, let's jump through the stages of lighting. The first ingredients here is an area light coming from the side, which is quite boring, I think. And keep your eye on that area here. And in the next slide, you see there's a subtle coloring going on. You see that? And it's the effect. Just imagine yourself standing in a room in summer, maybe, and there's a red, par a red car parking outside of your window, and you see the red color from the car on your ceiling. You, you know that effect? It's nothing else than a camera obscura. Light being focused by the hole of your window and being reflected inside your room. It's a camera obscura principle. And this coloring here is nothing else than that camera obscura principle, but with a very cheap and dirty trick. It's just a texture for the light. A transparency channel, a color gradient, applied to the light source itself with a texture tag, and that's it. Camera Obscura. Very cheap, very dirty, sorry. Okay, next one. Sun, of course. It's an infinite light with area shadows. We want area shadows, of course, focusing. And we have a sky dome going on here for the items on, uh, on the washing machine and the fridge. And we have some bounce lights. These are manually placed lights, and while I'm stepping through these, you might get the idea that there's no global illumination going on here. So everything you see right now is local illumination. Why I'm doing this? Because, okay, it's some kind of sports for me. I just love to do it. It's just a passion. I want to have the full control over my lighting setup. I don't want to hassle with uh, splotches, scrolling, whatever. And I'm CPU-based, and I'm doing animation. So I want to have a good sleep and a bulletproof lighting setup and finish my project in time. So I do the lighting myself with local illumination. You don't have to do that. You're free to choose. But I do it. I love it. OK. And here is something going on that's diffuse, a diffuse brightening. What's that? OK. Subsurface scattering, you know. But what's shadow luminance? Shadow luminance is just um, a shadow setup I came up with, let's say, three years ago. It's nothing special. It's just a, um, a self-luminance in shadowed areas. Uh, shader specific, of course, material specific. So um, the material of that fridge um, has a shadow luminance going on, the luminous channel. So if you want to know more about that, check out my 2015 uh, SIGGRAPH talk from LA. You can find it on www.renderbron.de in the publications section. And check out what is about uh, what's there, what's about shadow luminance. Okay, here we have some smart ambient occlusion going on, only appearing in shadowed areas, and some more bounce lights because these plates here um, are still lives for themselves because we are focusing with the camera, we're concentrating on them while moving around them. So you have to do a little extra care in terms of light for them. That means I place, go back, I place a bounce light here for the plates. I place some um, bounce light for the tomatoes, looking like that. Color bleeding for the plate, looking like that. Uh, some color bleeding for the mixer like that, and so on. Just a three-point setup, of basically, for those sub-still lives. Okay? And while we're looking at the shadows, there's something strange going on here. Because, obviously, we have transparent objects in that scene, um, like this, uh, this glass object, or the bottles, or, of course, that drinking glass. But the shadow is opaque. Why is that? Because I deactivated the option transparency in the shadows of my sunlight. And why did I do that? What the hell? 
Because normally you would think, okay, activate that, um, that uh, option, which is normally by default activated, and then transparency gets considered by um, casting shadows, by shadows, but then it looks like that. Not good. It's like a paper cut shadow. It's like, okay, um, transparency is taken into consideration while casting shadows, but not the refraction. And that's a huge, eh, come on, do it. So what do we do about that? Um, take a look at real live lighting. What we have here is a glass standing in my studio. And we see there's a shadow going on, the absence of light, a vacuum, no light, or let's say light deviated by refraction. And there are some caustics going on, artifacts from refraction. So when light gets deviated and absent, it creates a shadow and it gathers at certain points which are caused, uh, called caustics. So shadows are the deviation of light and caustics are the results of refraction. So what do we do about our opaque shadows? You get it? Activate caustics, of course. So I placed an additional spotlight. I rendered that as a separate layer, of course, within the take system of Cinema 4D, which is a cool feature, by the way. And um, added that in compositing. And it's looking quite natural. So I was happy with that. We have those light shimmering and caustics going on, and it's really enhancing realism. And we had some thinking outside the box because we deactivated transparency for shadows and instead activated caustics. And that's one of the downsides to a ray tracer like the physical render because Maxon recently acquired Redshift, a great render engine, and um, Redshift is a path tracer. So it's calculating all the aspects of light in a process called light transport. So caustics come basically for free, not as an extra add-on as it is in physical render. So that's a plus for a path tracer, and let's say, okay, come, be honest, a downside to a ray tracer. Because you have to activate caustics, extra, deactivate transparency for shadows, okay, it's a workaround. But we can live with it. There's some extra cheating going on with the bottles here at the top of the image. You see that? Some extra caustics or indirect light. No, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very dirty trick. Just three spotlights colored, placed, um, yeah, in front of the olive oil vinegar and the pumpkin seed oil. So, when we um, head further in our process, the ingredients to realism are also um, important when it comes to composition. Because when it, no matter how found footage like your animation is and how real life the character of your animation might be, it's always a good idea to introduce some color schemes or let's say a firm color world to make your image more coherent and the atmosphere a bit more dense and the image more interesting. So that means use color schemes and contrasts. So what do we have here? We have those main players here, focusing our full attention because it's highly saturated red, orange, something like that. And it's been contrasted by complementary contrast blue. Those guys here, the flakes, uh, the salt, the mineral tablets in the tube, are complementary contrasting the colors. On the other hand, the main colors are continued by this guy here, by that mineral tablet tube also orange and red, and even by the cap of the winger. So we have a strong, let's say, a construction of image areas communicating with each other, either by contrast or by continuation. So even the green of the branches of the tomato are continued by the colors of the glass and the lacquered metal here. So that's some deeper thought on uh, composition. And of course, a human camera behavior and depth of field are um, the essence of making it found footage-like. So uh, you, you can't do a close-up without depth of field. That's, that's a no-brainer, okay? And here we have another angle. Okay, and another 
ingredients to realism is enhance your dynamic range. That means what I like to do is, this is a raw render, what I like to do is always light and shade my scene a little, a little bit too flat. So it's appearing a bit too, a bit too, maybe not boring, but a little bit too flat and render it with at least 16 bit depth. So I have enough dynamic range in compositing to do a high dynamic range, to increase brightness, to make shadows more powerful, and to give it a little bit more punch and make it more interesting. Last but not least, destroy your image. While that might sound a little bit martial, um, it means don't fall in love with your imagery so much that you're afraid to introduce some imperfections to it that make it just more looking real, that make it just more uh, real life. So what I mean is um, introduce a certain kind of area. Uh, what I mean is chromatic aberration at the edges of the image. What I mean is glow, light wrapping. Um, maybe even overdo the glow a little bit in certain areas. Um, there's grain going on. More grain in darker areas, less grain in bright areas, as you would have it with, with analog film or even with digital film. And there are some um, imperfections that make it just look more real life and less digital and perfect. So, best for last, that scene will be available for download, for free. What? And uh, to know when and where, you have to give me a like at Facebook. How's that? So there I will um, post this scene. Uh, I, will, I will announce where this scene is um, available for download. The background behind this is that scene was, to come back to the beginning, was created for benchmarking purposes for Intel, to benchmark that powerful machine with the uh, 3170X Xeon processor. And you as an artist should have the same uh, possibility to use this scene for own benchmarking purposes and test your own Intel processor with it. And one last thing, I have trainings available on shading, lighting and rendering. So as you might have seen, this is rather complex stuff. Everything is interfering with everything, so it's rather hard to learn, but you can do it at my facility, at my studio. I'm a Max Arthur Training Center, directly at the River Rhine in Düsseldorf, and you can learn shading, lighting, and rendering there. So folks, that's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>